The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom is a brilliant open world game. But publishers and developers should be making smaller games, not bigger ones. Let's talk about it. Tam, why are we talking about open world games? What, what is, is the deal, deal with Zelda? open world games? <laughs> We're talking about it because obviously The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom Never is uh, his uh, <laughs> reviews have dropped by now. It's probably is it out now? It's probably it's out, out now. now yeah. Friday. It got the elusive, illustrious, the iconic ten out of ten on Gamespot.com, as Essential. well as various other websites, except for that one. You know that one. Oh, you know <laughs> that one. one. <laughs> <laughs> kind of got us thinking about open world games that we've played over the last few years, and how many of them were actually worth our time investment. You know, um, there's like been a few major successes in that genre recently something that really pushes the medium forward it kind of ignites this worry again like, mm. i don't think it's going to happen but i start to feel like oh people are going to want to do these games again now they're going to want to try and do more open world games because we had that phase where it was like everyone was making an open world game mm. so this is a kind of like attempt to be like hey there is another way there has to be another way there is First things first, we are not here to yuck anyone's yum at all. If you really enjoy playing open world games, or if you're a game designer and you have made, or you feel like you could make an amazing open world game, then more power to you. This is just based on our observations as people who examine trends, play a lot of these open world games, and it's kind of an extension of the conversation we had last week about chasing trends, but obviously mm. back then we were talking about Destiny games as a service yeah. stuff. Yeah, now we're talking about open worlds. Yeah. Kind of Redfall falls into as well to a degree. It falls into the trap that we're talking about here. Sorry. Not the trap. Sorry, but okay. like so it's become clear recently. I mean, this feels like pointing out the most obvious that open world games are overwhelming. Mm. But more recently, I think it's become clear that there's a good kind of overwhelming mm. and a bad kind of overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So games like Ubisoft is going to take a lot of L's in this episode. I know. I'm I sorry. feel I, like when when you were putting the runner show together and you were like listing all the games that do open world stuff, or at least have had a negative impact in open world game design, I have gone on record and I've called it the Ubisoftification yeah, yeah. of open world like, game design. If you're a Ubisoft developer, sorry, but it is what it is. Your games like, are still incredibly games successful. Are, yeah, they sell the, a lot. I started Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and immediate was like, no, I'm not doing this. I was playing Far Cry Six and I zoomed out the map. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't realize you were on an island at the beginning. So I zoomed out the map and I was like, oh, that's a pretty big world. Then yeah. I kept zooming out. And, and this was on. an island that was an offshoot of the main place yep. that was so big and so scattered with icons. I just took one look at it. And I just went, absolutely not. Yeah, that is the bad kind of overwhelming. The good kind of overwhelming is Elden Ring or Tears of the Kingdom. It's a feeling that, oh, I've got so much to do, but you're excited to do it. And currently the ratio of good overwhelming to bad overwhelming is not in good's favor. Right now for, I think for me and a lot of people, open worlds aren't particularly an exciting prospect in mm. the way that they used to be. There's a little bit of open world burnout. I, it feels I think. like chores. Also on top of that, like from a development perspective, they are a massive undertaking, right? We should also talk about like what they represent, mm. used to represent and what they represent now. Mm. Because I think that helps kind of frame mm. the conversation in a lot of ways. Yeah. Because in my mind, for most people, chances are their experience of an open world that really stuck with them is GTA 3. Yep. Right? That was the game that showed us what scale games could go to in that period. Open worlds start to become this kind of benchmark mm -hmm. for like technology and development tools and and stuff that packed powers. Like you, sh mm -hmm. if you had a new piece of hardware or console, the way you showed off how powerful it is by like, look at this open world we've made here. It's look huge. how many trees we got yeah, in look here. How many trees. Look at that draw distance. Look how much speed tree is doing for us. <laughs> yeah. Speed tree, legit. Shout out to speed tree. The open world games, they also became a bit of a flex. And gamers were interested in that. Like there was a time where we were like, oh shit, open world. Like, I mean, Skyrim, God, yeah. Oblivion too. Yeah, just like uh, remember like, seeing those and just being like, oh my God, this is all on one two yeah. discs. And you, you got like games that were top tier open worlds, but you, you also got a lot of like mid to low tier open worlds. Or publishers are seeing that they, they like these open world games, let's make open world games. And that kind of, I feel like that momentum carried forward for a really long time. And I don't think we've had a, this is a weird charge phrase, I don't think we've had a come to Jesus moment for open worlds, uh, open world games since then. I mean, Forspoken, I think for me was the most recent memory yeah. of very, sorry, I don't like being negative, but a very uninspired open world filled exactly. with chores. It's, it's the epitome of people like open world games. Let's make an open world game. Mm -hmm. But what is it bringing to the story? What is it bringing to the gameplay? Yeah. Why are we doing this? So let's talk about what the issue is here. And open world games, as we said, massive in scale, scope and possibilities. Yeah. Um, they demand a lot of your time and attention. It mm -hmm. can be overwhelming. And 
The genre, I think, was, it's fair to say, has become stagnant in a lot of ways. Lucy, what was the last genuinely meaningful evolution in the open world genre? Not counting Elden Ring and uh, Zelda, because we're positing they are. If you look at GTA V and Red Dead Redemption 1, yeah. those are just exceptionally well done open worlds. They feel, you know, the whole goal is to feel lived in. Yeah. There's unique characters, animations, uh, events, wherever you go within the world. If we're being reductive, which, you know, you have to occasionally to make this kind of argument. Mm. The basic format of an open world hasn't changed since GTA 3. Mm -hmm. Like you have a map, it's probably a real place, might be a fantasy place. Mm -hmm. Quest markers, massive space, lots of people, things to do, most of it fluff, some of it really good. Mm -hmm. The best in the open world genre do some aspect of that really, really well. Mm -hmm. So like the story or, you know, the characters, mm -hmm. the Witcher story, oh, characters. Yeah. You know what? Character switching in GTA across That was, the map. yeah, but again, like mechanically, yeah. I would argue that's an execution thing that's okay. cool. Like three yeah. characters is really cool. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a flex. Like they've yeah. rendered that entire world and yeah. you can move from one point to the other to another character without any sort of like issues with that. For me, the thing that's made it stand out or the last two things that made it stand out is probably parkour from, from Assassin's Creed Yep. and swinging in Spider-Man. The, the major successes in the genre are like Witcher 3 for writing, Elden Ring for its like sense of discovery and yep. bringing that and from software combat to big space, Zelda Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom for like freedom discovery and creative problem solving with the open-ended crafting system. This yeah. is gonna sound rough and again, maybe reductive. AC3 onwards, like not a lot going on in those franchises, not in that franchise. Like it grew in scale. Yeah. And like the thing that I look back on, like what is the most like interesting addition to AC as a formula, it's the two characters, Evie and, oh, and Jacob. I would, I, would I would have said like AC4, open world at sea. Yeah. Looking forward to Skull and Bones, uh, whenever <laughs> that comes out. But like, still very close still, to the original formula. You were still formula. going to forts, discovering yep. places, battling people at sea. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of scope is, is getting bigger. I would argue they're ballooning in size. Interestingly, the bigger those games got, the, the less, less you could use parkour, <laughs> which was it's that kind of main feature. And they also changed parkour. Yeah, it used it to be, uh, you know, back in AC2, it used to be very, very particular things you could not couldn't climb on. And then in, maybe it, it was Syndicate, they gave you a bloody zip line, so yeah, you didn't even line. have to climb yeah. anything. And like, I remember in 2, there was like this thrill to jumping yeah. off a uh, off a roof and then holding the grab button where he mm -hmm. puts his hand out, Ezio puts his hand out, and whether you're gonna hit or yeah. not. That was cool, and it had a skill basing. Over time, the games got bigger, more of them came out, we s less and less of that, and like the skill base component almost was was gone from it. So like, let's think about these various games mm -hmm. and how they've evolved, mm -hmm. and whether do you think it's meaningful. Watch Dogs to Watch Dogs Legion. Massive, got big. Got bigger, got, big. got That's more what I mean. complicated, yeah. and did that really meaningfully change anything? Like Legion had that cool, like anyone everywhere, whatever, but like mm. I, that that wasn't enough to keep me coming back. Ghost Recon Advanced Warfighter to Ghost Recon Wildlands. What happened? It just got bigger. Yeah. And like arguably Ghost Recon lost its identity as it went bigger and bigger. Yeah. Mirror's Edge versus Mirror's Edge Catalyst. Again, Mirror's Edge Catalyst, mm. a bigger game, bigger. but watered down the core mechanic of parkour and like, mm being able to like find lines easily and like crafting that kind of stuff. Far Cry 3 versus Far Cry 6. Like, oh yeah. I mean, Far Cry 3, fantastic game. Yeah. A very controlled experience. Didn't feel too overwhelming. A lot of really cool interconnecting systems. And then Far Cry 6, just a jumble of uh, Yeah, it's, it's that ballooning. And it's not just Ubisoft that needs to take these L's. Like Saints Row, the latest one. Like there's a lot of things that contributed to that game yeah. not being particularly great, but it's an open world and it had nothing meaningful to offer. It was just yep. an open world for the sake of being an open world. Hogwarts Legacy. What is the best part of Hogwarts Legacy? It's being in Hogwarts. That's mm. everyone says, every review says, Hogwarts is great. Once you go out of there, it's not great. Yeah. Redfall is the same. Ghostwire Tokyo. For spoken, for sure. For spoken, 100%, yeah. Horizon. I'm gonna, I'm gonna annoy a lot of people, Horizon. I think the bar now has been raised and the bar to clear is not, does it do these things? Mm. It's, does it do new things? Well, there was that viral tweet going around, which was, uh, Godspeed to every game designer who's got a meeting with their team lead on Monday. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing, that's the thing. I hope Tears of the Kingdom inspires more interesting conversations about more interesting yeah. takes on the open world formula. That's, that's kind of the worry that has led to this yeah. episode, where it's like, no one, not everyone can make a Zelda. Maybe there is a better alternative. Go on. Let's present it. 
Okay. Like scale your games down. Okay. Like uh, it sounds very reductive, and many developers are probably if they watch this are going to be like, yeah, it's easy to say. It's you know, easy to say. We're sorry. It is easy to say. We get it. We don't make games. Mm. We try. <laughs> we just think we about games. We play a awful amount of them. Yeah, we play a lot of them, and just simply go and scale them down mm. is like it doesn't consider like market expectations and like business it doesn't, it doesn't consider the men in suits yeah that's a core part of it but the idea i think like maybe romanticized is smaller games that deliver depth in a small space mm. instead of open worlds that deliver shallowness in a big one sounds like we've got like a a strap line for a new company yeah, like it's, it's <laughs> smaller spaces more meaningful <laughs> more, experiences more depth, yeah. <laughs> i think of them as open environments as mm -hmm. opposed to open worlds okay. that's how they exist in my head and these are games that are given that have worlds that are given character through scope and depth mm. rather than their breadth outer wilds it feels endless it feels yep. huge but if you put it relative to all other open worlds it's very small deus ex human revolution mass effect 2 yakuza those are Speaking games that feel huge and yeah. vast but if you think about it they're basically interconnected hubs mm -hmm. like you're moving around just hub hub areas mm -hmm. but they still feel massive right yeah and that is kind of like the ideal like dense smaller environments um, and this is kind of like what led to the assassin's creed thing where people were like okay can you just make a smaller assassin's creed mm. you know? oh and god i remember doing like all the press events for unity and i remember them going yeah we've recreated paris like, I, was like I don't want to be in at, paris. A, at a scale <laughs> and i was like what do you mean i've been to paris i'm all right now we got mirage right it's a smaller area and that is so exciting because yeah. look at all the power we have now look at all the development know-how and design know-how we have apply that to something much smaller in scale where you get depth instead of breadth and that is like a really exciting prospect we are seeing more of these open environment games mm -hmm. recently like jedi survivor is technically yep. one of those final fantasy 16 is the next one to do it right oh, like they had I'm excited, a few, boy. yeah and that's just a series of interconnected hubs Love it. i spoke to Haim, who went to a preview and confirmed it I was, he was like yeah just hubs everyone's attention and we talked about this last week mm. everyone is vying for everyone else's attention and the thing with open world games is when they get too overwhelming i can easily drop off yeah but if it is a if it is an experience where it feels like i am making a difference or it's interesting enough and it is it's grabbed me and it is dragging me through it because I can't take my, I physically can't peel myself yeah. away. That's what I want from an open world game. I don't think the traditional model of an open world game does that anymore. People can still make big games, but the ones that are really sticking with us mm -hmm. are the ones that do something interesting beyond the traditional GTA 3 style format. Mm -hmm. Death Stranding, massive world, but you're just walking through it, right? A lot of and like a lot of walking, but like it's a kind of introspective, mm -hmm. almost like isolating, lonely mm -hmm. experience. And that is unique. There's no, nothing else like that. Nothing, love it or hate it, nothing else like yep. Death Stranding exists. Metal Gear Solid Five. Again, it's not a de as dense an open world or like as vibrant an open mm. world as something like GTA or whatever, but it brought stealth into an open world genre, yep. which is, hasn't been done as good since. Mm -hmm. Sea of Thieves, sailing. No one's done that before. Spider-Man, swinging. No one's done it as good mm -hmm. as Insomniac are doing it. No Man's Sky, space. It's got space. <laughs> like, space. It does a lot of space and it's like grown and, and it's become really good. Yeah. So the question then becomes like, is your open world as good as The Witcher, Elden Ring or Zelda? Or does it do something that's additive to the genre? If not, maybe you should make a smaller game. So those are our thoughts on open world games. Let us know what you think about them and our argument for smaller games in yeah. the comments. Team Small Games. Team Small Games. Team yeah. Small Games. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, obviously, Spot On is part of a brand new slate of programming we're releasing here on GameSpot. Uh, the reception has been so lovely. So if you're watching at home, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. We've got stuff like No HUD, How It's Saved, Expert Reacts, Fire Remix, Expert Reacts, History of Timeline, mm. and of course, Spot On. So yeah. it's, it's packed. Keep watching them. Please Keep do. clicking them. We want to make more. Yeah, we do. Uh, and I'm on Twitter at Lucy James Games. I'm at Tamor H. And thank you again for watching. We'll see you next time.